Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. And in this video, we're going to be discussing the great man of Nebuchadnezzar's dream and also Samson. Taken from the Student's Monthly Letter by Manly P. Hall, October 1937. The Secret Doctrine in the Bible. Dear friend, in the connection with the previous works, it is interesting to identify the Queen of Sheba according to the Kabbalistic system. The word Sheba means seven. She is, therefore, the Queen of the Seven and represents the spiritual fire in the human body. She is Kundalini, the serpent goddess of the seven chakras. The Queen of Sheba comes from Ethiopia or the land of darkness. She journeys to Jerusalem, bearing rich treasures for the everlasting house. In occult anatomy, the land of darkness is at the base of the spine. It is from here that the cold Kundalini rises slowly to the brain, awakening the chakras. This ascent is frequently referred to as a journey. In the Bible, it is a visit to Jerusalem, which means not only the city of peace, but also the city of stacks or heaps an arcane reference to the convolutions of the brain, the great man of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. In the second chapter of the book of Daniel, beginning at verse 21 and continuing through verse 45, is the account of a strange dream that came to the king of Babylon. The king beheld a great image, the head of which was of fine gold, its shoulders and arms of silver, its body of brass, its legs of iron, and its feet a mixture of iron and clay. As the great figure stood in all its glories, a cubic stone was mysteriously cut from a quarry and cast by invisible hands at the feet of the great image. As the stone struck the feet, the image was destroyed, changing into fine dust. The cube afterward grew greater in size until it became as vast as a mountain. The explanation given by Daniel is definitely misleading. The prophet explains to Nebuchadnezzar that the golden head, the silver arms and shoulders, the brazen body, the iron legs, and the feet of iron and clay symbolize empires that shall fall one after the other. From this conceit has arisen much confusion in modern theology. Every nation of the ancient and modern world has been associated with the parts of Nebuchadnezzar's image. The Second Adventists have rejoiced at and various Bible societies have announced the millennium as a result of calculations based upon the parts of this symbolic figure. These millennianites have been fixing dates for the second coming for nearly a thousand years, but the end is not yet. This is a fair example of the general lack of research and scholarship evident among most groups of religious enthusiasts. The figure of Nebuchadnezzar's dream is definitely a microcosm man, the great Kabbalistic man of the Zohar, the Adam Kadmon, the world symbol later received in Alexandria under the name Serapis. The Alexandrian Serapis, as described by the earlier church fathers, was a figure composed of many metals and substances, including even plants. It was worshipped as an epitome of nature, divine and human. Therefore, its upper parts were of more precious substances, and its lower parts of baser materials. Although the description given in Daniel is somewhat mutilated, nevertheless the symbolism is apparent. The head of the image is of gold, the upper body and arms of silver, the lower body of bronze, and the legs and feet of a substance composed of the mingling of iron and clay. Compare these with the four ages of the Greeks, the gold, the silver, the bronze, and the iron. Also with the four yogas of the Hindus, of which the lowest or fourth, the Kali Yoga, corresponds closely with the feet of iron and clay. The ancient Zohar says the four worlds were represented by the four atoms, or the four parts of one colossal figure, whose body nature is, and God the soul. This great figure is always described by the Kabbalist with its face in profile without eyelids and ornamented with a long beard ending in 13 points. The head of this being is gold, symbolizing the pure nature of divinity, the head of all life. The silver arms and shoulders correspond to the active parts, the hierarchies which emanate from the golden head. 
They are the builders, the angels, the archangels, the seraphim, and the cherubim, the thrones, and the dominations, and the principalities. The bronze body is the zodiac, the planets, the material cosmos, the forms of the hierarchies above, and, lastly, the fourth world of iron and clay represent the earth, which, according to the ancient philosophers, was girded by a wall of iron. Here the iron is the firmament, and the clay the planet earth itself. Nor do the analogies end here, for the figure represents the cycles of generation, the head is birth, the shoulders growth, the body maturity, the legs age, and the feet death. Here is also represented the constitution of man, the mental body gold, the emotional body silver, the vital body bronze, and the higher and lower parts of the physical body iron and clay. The figure, therefore, is a kind of sephiroth, a tree in the form of a man, a tree that bears the world and the heavens upon its branches, and represents in its various parts the divisions of both the macrocosm and the microcosm. Here also is signified the five races and the four world periods, the fourth being divided into two parts, the Mars-Mercury halves of the Earth. The cubic stone in the Christian Kabbalah has been exoterically interpreted as Christ. This is the stone the builders rejected, but which becomes the head of the corner. The theologians would have us believe that the ages and the law, the cycles and the worlds, the mechanism of the ancient mysteries were all dissolved and destroyed by the messianic dispensation. But consider the symbolism of the cube. It is the most perfect of the geometric solids. Being equal in all its parts, it consists of six faces, which represent the days of creation, and of twelve lines, which symbolize the zodiac. If each of the faces be open to the core, the result will be a cruciform, design consisting of six pyramids. Each of the separate pyramids will have four faces, which total twenty-four, the number of the elders before the throne in Revelation, and also the hours of the day. If the 24 hours be added to the six faces of the cube, the result will be 30, the degrees of the zodiacal sign, and a twelfth part of a circle. It is written, therefore, that the perfect cube is symbolic of the New Jerusalem, the city four square. According to the Pythagoreans, the cube is a symbol of both matter and man, the opening of the cube being a symbol of the unfoldment of man and the releasing of geometric mysteries within himself. To the Christian, Christ is the perfect man, therefore he becomes the embodiment of the perfect measure of a man, the cube. In Freemasonry, the perfect ashlar or true stone is the proper figure of the perfect man for he is square, upright, and true, which are the moral qualities of a cube. The perfect cube represents the personality that has had all the unevenness, roughness, and inequality polished away by experience. Such a stone is ready to become a block in the everlasting house not built by hands, but eternal in the heavens. If, then, Nebuchadnezzar's man symbolized the universe and the world, and the stone symbolizes the adept, the perfect man, then we understand how worldliness is dissipated by wisdom, and how the material world is overcome by that which is square and true, and being overcome is entirely dissipated, leaving not a rat behind. We now understand why this cubed stone becomes larger and larger until it becomes a mountain. Wisdom itself is frequently symbolized by a mountain or hill. Truth, having overcome error, fills the whole world with itself, increasingly greater in size. It fills the life of him to whom it is revealed. The Story of Samson The life of Samson is given in Judges 13 through 16, inclusive. Careful study will show that the entire account is a cleverly concealed myth which parallels very closely the Greek myth of Hercules. The name Hercules means the glory of Hera, who was the queen of heaven. In Hebrew, Samson means sun-like. Samson is a solar personification and, like Hercules, performs certain labors consistent with his role. The myth was devised evidently when the vernal equinox occurred in Taurus, 
or at least under the influence of such a concept. It is especially interesting to note that the strength of Samson lay in his seven locks of hair. In classical symbolism, the hair of the sun gods represent his rays or power. For this reason, the infant sun god, born at the winter solstice, is represented with one lock of hair. Its powers or rays increases as it moves from the winter solstice to the summer solstice. Under these conditions, it will reach the summer solstice in Leo with seven locks of hair. One of the great labors of Hercules was slaying one of the Nemea lions and dressing in its skin. Samson likewise slew a lion and found honey in its carcass. The sun reaching Leo is robed in the sign of the celestial lion. Its essential dignity according to astrology. By the same rule, the carrying away of the gates of Giza would correspond with the vernal equinox when the sun breaks away from the captivity of winter. The sign of Leo is followed by Virgo, the virgin, which is Delilah. This is the sun's first sign of decreasing light. Delilah, therefore, after three unsuccessful attempts, discovers the secret of his strength, and at the autumnal equinox, cuts off his hair or rays. Later he is blinded, further to emphasize his loss of power. But finally in death, the winter solstice, he destroys the house of the Philistines by bringing down the two central columns. This is a grand astronomical myth and has a certain messianic significance. It should be remembered that all sun gods are prototypes of the Christ or phases of the Christ mythos. An early theological writing says that Christ by his death destroyed death and brought an end to evil in the world. This is perfectly prefigured by Samson tearing down the house of the Philistines and dying himself to destroy the wicked. As Samson's seven locks of hair were the secret of his strength, so the Lamb of God bleed from seven wounds. All sun god myths are indicative not only of the sun in the sky, but the small sun or spirit in man, which achieves emancipation by the performance of the twelve labors, which make his zodiac of experience. Thus, all the world saviors are personifications of humanity's struggle for truth and final accomplishment of immortality. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider helping Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description below. Thank you very much.